Sandra was a last minute addition to the program tonight. Uh, as of the end of the service this morning, I believe we had no idea who was going to be leading the, the, the hymns, and we were unable to identify anybody to sing the special music, and, and uh, Sandra agreed to do both. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 4 this evening as we continue our study in the book of Romans. This study I'm calling uh, Romans a study in theology. Again, this is to me the, the greatest theological treatise ever written. And there's, there's such richness in this particular uh, book of the Bible. It, it occurred to me just a few days ago, I believe I've been teaching on this book since the beginning of the year except for special occasions and we are just now in Romans chapter 4 and the, the, there are six, 16 chapters in the book of Romans so it tells me that if I continue this pace it will take us roughly four years to get through the book of Romans and uh, that, that's quite alright, there's a, I can't think of his name, he's a well known pastor up in the Raleigh dorm area of North Carolina. He's got a radio program for the life of me. I can't call his name. But uh, he, he was known for taking about five years to preach through the book of Romans. And since I could do it in four, I consider myself much more efficient than he. You know, but at any rate, at any rate, we're going to take the time we need you know, as, as God leads me and and hopefully you'll be blessed with that as a result. Tonight we're going to take a look at, uh, again, as we continue to, to look at this, this example, chapter 4 is Paul using the Old Testament uh, persona of Abraham and taking this great historical figure, the, the father of the Israeli faith and uh, uh, this, this great man of God and, and using the entirety of chapter 4 pretty much to talk about Abraham's faith and how that re, the truths that we can pull from that regarding faith. And he, cont he continues that even tonight. Tonight I'm going on the, the title, Faith is the Standard. Faith is the standard. I can't, I'm not sure if you can make out the graphics behind that, but it's a series of, of different measuring sticks, uh, different rulers and such. I wanted to put that as, as kind of a, an emphasis that, that everything we do, are, are, it, we're measured by the amount of faith we have, not by the goodness we have. Not, not by the amount we give to certain ministries or the church or our service or any of those things. Faith is indeed the standard. Amen? Faith is the standard. And Paul emphasized that again tonight here in chapter 4. We're looking at verses 18 through 25. Have you found your way there yet? And how he's going right back to Abraham and talking about that everything that, that Abraham had, the entire example of his life, all boils down to his faith. All boils down to his faith, and that's the same thing for you and I. The measure of who we are as men and women it is not what we've accomplished while on earth in terms of goals or achievements or any of that. It's not what we've done in terms of our uh, goodness to humanity or any other type of measuring rod that many people would like to measure us by. It all comes down to our faith. For Abraham, it all came down to his faith. For us, it all comes down to our faith. If you're in the habit of taking notes, there's three points I'm going to make this evening. Three points, three simple points. And I'm going to break down this passage, 18 through 25, and really through the, the, I'm just going to read those in sections. So I'm not going to ask you to, to stand for the reading of God's Word, but I hope you give it full reverence and honor, even though we don't stand for it. Romans chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, lead us right into point number 1. Again, this is Paul recounting the example of Abraham. And in verse 18 he says, In hope against hope, he, that's Abraham, believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. And of course, this Paul is referring to Abraham where he received a great promise of God that even though here he was 99 years old, 
Sarah was just a few years younger than he, so she was not the, the, you know, what we would consider childbearing age, but yet God had promised them that he would be and they would be the, the, the progenitors of a great generation of people, that many, many people would come forth from them. Their, their descendants would be as, as numerous as the stars, even. What a great promise. And most of us would consider that to be foolishness. But Abraham believed that promise. And that's point number one. Point number one is that faith believes in God's promises. Amen? Faith believes in God's promises. When I was doing research for this particular sermon, I, I came across a, a story, a true story. Now, I didn't record the date of it. I Forgive me for that. I read it, but I didn't write it down in my notes. This was a particular school teacher by the name of Everett Storms. He was a school teacher in a, a place called Kitchener, Canada, if I pronounce that right. Kitchener is the name of the town, Canada. And this took place, if I remember the story correctly, sometime in the late 1800s. And this is long before computers, long before many of the reference materials we have. If you go in my study back here, for instance, I have concordances and all kind of reference books and, and uh, topical references and everything else. I can look up. I've got a book back there that lists the promises of God in it, uh, in, in, in different categories such as that. But back then, back in the late 1800s, we didn't have this wealth of a library that most people had access to. Certainly not a school teacher. There was not the internet, so you couldn't do a, a Google search, or there was no software to look this up. But he knew that the Bible had many, many promises of God, so he put it upon himself as a personal goal to find out how many promises of God were contained in Scripture. So he started in Genesis chapter 1 and worked his way all the way through the entirety of the Bible. And when he got done, it took him a year and a half. And for a year and a half, he, he scoured Scripture. He just he poured over it, looking for these promises. And, and uh, in fact, it was during his 27th reading of the entire Bible that, uh, that he concluded that the Bible contained... 7,487 promises that God has made to man. 7,487 promises that he identified in Scripture. And again, this is just one man sitting there and reading God's Word numerous times to identify the Scriptures. One of the things we're told in Scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 tells us that God's promises are precious and they're magnificent. And Romans chapter 3 verse 4 assures us that God can be uh, trusted to deliver on his promises. Amen? Amen? So if God makes 7,487 promises, God's going to deliver on every one of those. Every one of those. 7,487 promises made by God to his people and he can be trusted to deliver on every single one of those promises. Paul tells us of Abraham here in verse 18 of Romans chapter 4. He uses the phrase, in hope against hope, he believed. In hope against hope, he believed. How many times has your situation seemed hopeless? How many times has Satan tried to convince you to doubt God? Or to doubt that God will deliver on his promises? To even doubt that God loves you? How many times has Satan tried to do that? How many times have you found yourself sulking in the face of hopelessness only for God to show up and to show out? <laughs> Amen? I believe that God sometimes, and maybe even oftentimes, chooses to save his best work for us when we feel as if there's nothing that he can do or will do. Am I right? 
Am I right? That's why it's so important to remember the promises of God, including what he gave to Moses to share with the people of Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, a promise that's repeated in part anyway, several places in Joshua, for instance. God says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. Talking about the enemies of Israel. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Now that is a promise that God's proven himself time and time again. Amen? God, God we can be strong and courageous because God is going with us. God is going with us. So point number one, faith trusts in God's promises. Point number two is faith trusts in God's power. Faith trusts in God's power. Look at verses 20 and 21. Again, Paul had just emphasized the point that that uh, here Abraham was nearly 100 years old. Here Sarah was roughly 90 years or so. And God said, you shall bear a child, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, what was that child that she bore to Abraham? Isaac. And what does Isaac mean? Anybody know? That's a Hebrew word for he laughs. Because when God told Abraham... Boy, you're 99, your wife is 90, but about this time next year, you're gonna, the two of y'all are going to have a son. What did Abraham do? He laughed. <laughs> he laughed at God. So God got back at him and he then said, you shall name your son. He laughs. Isaac. He laughs. Isaac. So God, God has made this promise here. Paul's talking about verses 18 and 19. And then verse 20. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. He was also able to perform. So for Abraham... Yes, although God, he laughed at God when God made this promise. You know, uh, I would laugh today. You know, if God would say, well, you're going to be a father again next year. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm 59 years old. Uh, uh, for what man has told me, it's, it's physically impossible for, for me to have children anymore. Um, but, um, you know, God's done bigger things than that. Amen. Yeah, yeah, but how many times have we laughed at God when God has told us things like that? But as long as our laughter and our initial take of humor on that, on that promise, when we turn around and actually believe it, which is what happened for Abraham. Yeah, he laughed at it. It seems ridiculous. But he also said, God's a mighty God. God's the one true God. If anybody can do it, God can. And I believe he can and will do it. So Abraham had faith where he believed in God's promise, but now he also has faith because he's trusting in God's power. He's trusting in God's power. For Abraham, his faith was on full display when he trusted that God would do what man says is impossible. Jesus affirms this when he declares in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus told the listeners, said, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Abraham believed that. He believed that. He knew that God could do whatever God set his mind and his will to do. Back in Genesis, how did all of this come to be? Creation. God determined it was going to be so. He spoke it into existence. If he can do that, God can do anything. Amen? He's omniscient. It means he knows all. He's omnipotent. It means he's all-powerful. He's almighty. He's the only true God. He's the one who has the power to do the things in our lives that we think are impossible. That we think are impossible. I've said it again, I see Carolyn sitting right here. 
I'm not sure what the doctors have told Carolyn, but a lot of people would doubt that Dewey would ever leave that nursing home again. I don't doubt. I believe that God can and will heal Dewey to the point where he's able to come back to his church. And I'm going to pray towards that until God makes it clear it's not his will. Same thing for other people I've known throughout my life in ministry. I've seen God do the impossible. Amen. I've seen God take a, 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 a body that was declared to be as good as dead and get to restore it to life. I've seen God do that. I've seen God provide children for barren couples. I've seen God provide miracles, not just in healing, but in life circumstances. I've seen God at work. Amen. God is all-powerful. Abraham believed that. He believed that God could do what he said he was going to do. And because of that, it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed and trusted in God's power. That God would do the impossible and give him and Sarah a child in their old age. The mother praying for healing for her leukemia-stricken child is showing faith by trusting in God's power. The father, praying for a wayward son, is showing faith by trusting in God's power. The unemployed husband is showing faith by trusting in God's power to provide for his family. The Sunday school teacher is showing faith by trusting in God's power to help her grow her class. The teenage student is showing faith by trusting in God's power to help them witness to their friends. We are all showing faith by trusting in God to display His power and do what only God can do. Amen? Faith believes in God's promises. Faith trusts in God's power. And finally, point number three, faith alone leads to righteousness. Faith alone leads to, leads to righteousness. Look at verses 22 through 25. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness because he believed. Now, not for his sake only was it written, that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Amen. Faith alone leads to righteousness question I have for you. Do you want to be seen as righteous in God's eyes? Well, if you do, live a life full of faith in Him. Do you want to leave a lasting impression on those around you? If so, walk by faith even when life is hard. Do you want to live a lasting or leave a lasting legacy for your children and your grandchildren? If so, teach them to trust in God and to live by faith. Because faith alone leads to righteousness. Faith is the standard. That's the only standard we'll be measured by. It's the only measurement that would count in the eternal sense. Faith believes in God's promises. Faith trusts in God's power. Faith alone leads to righteousness. Amen? Father God, help us to grow in our faith every day. Help us, O oh Lord, to cling tight to your word and the promises contained in it. Help us to love your word, Father, so we can't wait every 